Today we're going to continue on the theme we uh, spoke about last week as well, the new man. But before I do so, by way of exception, I would say I want to just give a shout out to uh, some dear uh, brethren that um, visited us last week all the way from Mexico. I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are. And um, it was really, uh, yeah very special and to be honest uh, i did not realize how special it was until afterwards um, and there are many things that uh, afterwards i thought should should have been said or should have been done but uh, nonetheless um, the lord knows and he will use this as uh, for his purpose and um, i just want to let you know that uh, we are praying for you and we are very grateful for your visit. Good. Having said that, we let's continue. Um, so we spoke last week about the new man, the conduct of the new man in particular. And today I want to talk about the responsibility of the new man. So um, by means of small recap, let's go to Romans 6. And I want to read verses 4 and 6. It says there, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So we read here that we are submerged in the waters of baptism, which is an external uh, expression of an internal change. Now, I emphasize that because some th believe or think that this is a ritual that actually is, is causing a change. In a remote sense it does, but I don't, don't want to go there. But it's, it's mainly the change has to be inside and you want to express that by having uh, yourself uh, baptized. And with that, our old man is crucified with Christ and a new man is created by God. And therefore, we should walk in newness of life. We are to renew our mind uh, and uh, to adjust our conduct. Our walk begins. And this is the last thing I touched on last week. It's a walk and it's a walk towards perfection. And... Um, that is illustrated by Hebrews 6, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So we are walking towards perfection. Now we know that sin separates man from God. Through Christ, the new man is created. It's a new creature with a new nature, uh, no longer the old man with the sin nature. And through that, reconciliation with God is achieved. Even reconciliation between men, as in Christ, all are members of the same family, same body. So there is reconciliation on, on multiple levels. And uh, Paul reiterates that uh, in various epistles. Um, one is uh, Galatians uh, 6 verse 12 through 16 there it says as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world, the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk accordingly to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. 
So he's saying here in so many words that uh, it's not about uh, physical descent. Uh, it's not about um, uh, being circumcised. Uh, no, there has to be a new creature, he says in verse 15. And this new creature has to walk in newness of life. Those who do that, they are the Israel of God. Then um, another um, part of scripture where Paul illustrates this is from Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verse 10 through 18. And I realize I'm reading quite some verses, uh, but please bear with me. Uh, it, it shows a picture here. And um, I know that there are people that um, click away when there is too many uh, scripture. But this is the word of God. And if we get tired of reading the word of God, we have a serious problem. So, um, Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who were sometimes far off may are made nigh by the blood of Christ for he is our peace who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Paul writes that God creates in himself a new man from two, and thus making peace. Reconciliation. Now who are these two? Uh, that is explained in verse 11. On one side those that are called uncircumcision, Gentiles and those that are called circumcision, the Israelites. They share one spirit in Christ and the wall that separates them is broken, has been broken down. There is no difference. At least there shouldn't be any difference. Um, in Colossians 3 verse 9 through 11, and I realize also that we've read many of these verses also last week, but, but uh, of course everything overlaps. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 9 through 11, um, it says there, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but in Christ is all and in all. It's obvious, your ancestry your nationality, your genealogy, it's irrelevant to the new man. You are either a follower of Christ or you are not. Again, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 through 20. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. The new man is reconciled to God by Jesus. And the new man becomes an ambassador for Christ in the ministry of reconciliation. We sang this song and they know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the spirit. 
Division and strife do not belong to the new man. And they are a terrible testimony. And we know, of course, this is from Satan, this division. Divide and conquer. Now we note from the passages that we just read that Paul speaks about circumcision. And that is so because Paul ex uh, understands and also explains the meaning of circumcision, what it symbolizes. According to God's law, all the males are circumcised on the eighth day of their lives. Now we know that number the number seven is the number of perfection. So adding one to get to eight restarts the cycle. The eighth day of the week is the first day of the new week. We have seven millennial days designated for men, the last of which is rest, Sabbath, Sabbath. And after that, everything will be made new. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. We can read that in uh, Revelation 20, chapter 21. In other words, eight is the number of new beginnings. It is a symbolic meaning of circumcision. The man that is circumcised on the eighth day is a new man. That's the new man. Physical circumcision points to that. It doesn't do that just like baptism doesn't change anything. It is symbolizing something. Um, Paul, however, um, makes the point that the new man is not new because of physical circumcision, but he is new because he obeys God and his heart is circumcised. And that's the, the, the difference he makes all the time. It's not about physical circumcision, which the, the Jews were so much pressing upon. It's about circumcision of the heart. The new man is spiritually circumcised. And we see that the creation of the new man, and we talked about it last week, um, consists of two parts. Uh, and the prophet Ezekiel explains them or describes them to us. Um, God, as God speaks through him, he says in chapter 36, verse 26, 26 and 27, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments, and do them. So what do we see? Two things. A new heart. A new heart will I give you. That parallels what Paul says regarding uh, renewal of the mind. We spoke about last week. Ephesians 4.23. Now you would say no, that's not true. Because Paul speaks about renewal of the mind. And Ezekiel speaks about a new heart. Um, we have to remember that in Hebrew. Heart and mind share the same word. The word lev. It's one and the same word for both. And the reason being that they are uh, intrinsically connected. They, are, they form one part of, of the person. Uh, the heart, the soul and the mind, they are one. And one cannot go without the other. It's very important because many Christians are Christians intellectually. They are Christians in their head, but not in their heart. And so... Um, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't work in the end. It has to be complete. So a new heart. That's the first thing. The second thing we find is a new spirit. It is God's Holy Spirit enabling man to walk in God's way. We spoke about that also last week. The Holy Spirit which can only be re uh, received after accepting Christ. And like Paul, Ezekiel 2 speaks of walking. Walking. It is not a one-time thing, but it is an ongoing walk. As we also saw the other time, Paul often speaks of putting on the new man. And the word he uses for this, I uh, showed you the other time, is uh, endio. Which means to sink into, to enter into, to put on. It's a regular word that is being used in Greek for putting on clothes. Uh, but in a sense, you sink into, you emerge into, into what, your clothes. Um, so it has that meaning too. 
So Paul uses this metaphor of putting on clothes when he commands us to adopt the Christian way of life. Likewise, he speaks of taking off clothes regarding abandoning the old worldly lifestyle, as we also just read in Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10. Every day, and maybe multiple times a day, we choose what clothes we wear. And unless we need to wear a uniform for a specific job, it is our free choice what we wear. And that is what Paul tries to tell us. We determine when to take clothes off and when to put clothes on, and which clothes they are. And it's a daily choice. And so it is with the way of life of the new man. Daily, even repeatedly each day, we must choose to put on the new man, the Christian way of life. Christianity is a way of life. And like with well-worn clothes, um, we must feel comfortable, so comfortable in them that we, we don't want to take them off, actually. It shows again that the new man is not born complete and finished, but rather is created in order to walk and to grow and to mature. And we have a lot of responsibility in that process. Paul actually does not use the um, analogy of being born or born again at all. But he uses the clothing analogy a lot. He wants to convey the point that Christians are, uh, have an ongoing responsibility to put on the new man. Um, the idea of being born again, although it's uh, of course a, a beautiful picture as well, um, but it might give people the idea that this just happens to you. Um, you are born again and that's miraculous and after that that's it it's finished but that is not uh, entirely so so god creates the new man and then compels us to adopt him and we demonstrate that we do so through our conduct and so the new man develops he grows he matures and so over the span of the christian life god is molding and shaping the new man as much as we allow him to. In other words, God and man are cooperating. Nothing is simply automatic, nothing is forced upon us. Uh, we can see that uh, collaboration also in the Old Testament, both with the circumcision and with the making of the new heart, heart and mind. Um, I go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. God says there, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. It is an interesting verse because it shows us that from the very beginning, God makes clear that circumcision is it's not about a physical thing, it's about the heart. That's not a New Testament thing, but that is actually what God has intended from the very beginning. And he says, you circumcise your heart. He's telling, therefore, us, uh, by proxy, eh, to circumcise the foreskin of the heart. However, later he says that he is the one to do that circumcision. In the same book, Deuteronomy, in chapter 30, verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So, we see two verses that seem to contradict each other, but they don't. They rather show that God does not force anything upon us. If we do not want it, then it doesn't happen. Neither can we do anything when God does not allow it. So it's both is true. We do it, but God allows it. God helps us. And therefore, in a way, you can say God is doing it, but he's not doing it without our cooperation. We read before in Ezekiel 36 that God creates a new heart and mind in us and gives us a new spirit. However, here too it is our responsibility to cooperate and adopt a new heart. Also in Ezekiel, in chapter 18, in verse 31, it says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So he said before, we read in Ezekiel 36, 
where God says, I will give you a new heart and I will uh, put uh, my spirit in you. And here he says, uh, make you a new heart and a new spirit. So again, seems to contradict, but no, it means that we have to cooperate. We have to allow God, we have to uh, desire it ourselves. God creates the new heart as he creates the new man. We can read also in Psalm 51, um, verse 10, where David calls out to God, creating me a new heart. And the word create that he uses there is bara, the same word that we find in Genesis 1, verse 1, which means truly to create something entirely new out of nothing. But for us to make a new heart, as he says here in Ezekiel 18, make you a new heart, it's not the word bara. We cannot create anything. Only God can. For us, he uses a different word, and that's the word asa, which means to fabricate. And to fabricate means to make something out of other things. Uh, if you look to any factory, they do not create things out of nothing. They fabricate things out of rough materials or of half products and put them together that's asa that is our part so god is his part he creates but then it's our part to make uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, thing to see if you understand the difference in these words so um, asa to fabricate to keep in, in also like keep my Sabbath it's the same word asa uh, or to prepare or to work or to do all this God creates bara a new heart he does his part we make us a new heart asa that describes our part we keep his law we do his commandments all this is asa and you can say it is Christian work massive taboo word I know but I use it anyway you can say it's Christian work as much as it is the Christian walk. It's the, our way of life. This is our walk. You cannot say, I walk with Christ and not, um, not keep his law, not uh, obey his word. Um, then you're not walking with him, actually. God works together with man in creating and nurturing the new man. And it are two sides of the same coin. And it's well illustrated in two back-to-back -back verses that Paul writes uh, to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see the... the uh, the word play here work out your salvation it's an instruction you have to do it and right away he says because it is god who works in you again not contradiction it means cooperation you can you have to work out your salvation that god gave you that god created that god made um, for his good pleasure but now now you do your part you receive it and you walk in it um, so as a new man um, we we follow a certain conduct this is what we spoke about last uh, last week uh, the conduct of the new man but we see that there is also responsibility actually the new man cannot exist without our cooperation it's up to us indeed to put it on but if we never put on the new man the new man will uh, eventually vanish and there will only be the old self so very important um, to see that there is reconciliation between God and man that allows this cooperation there is also reconciliation between between men uh, so that we as brethren also can edify and support our, uh, each other and it's a it's a wonderful um, gift that God gives us and, oh, and uh, an honor also that he gives us to cooperate with him um, just as he gave stewardship over the, his creation um, as we read in, in Genesis that's a privilege that's a privilege we become now partakers 
of that which he made for his pleasure. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Amen. <laughs>